Greetings, humans. You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hey, everybody. How's it going? This is the command zone. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. We had to do that intro three times. <laughs> take three. Take three. Uh, but Usually you're like a one-take wonder. What happened? I don't know. I think it's because I have a head cold, so if you, I sound a little nasally, Maybe that's a little, why. A uh, yeah. little, little Vegas hangover. Yeah, yeah that there. is. A yeah, little I, pre-release hangover. I think the pre-release did it. It was the extra like button on top when I had slept for three hours and then decided to play Magic for five. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't in Vegas, but I did the pre-release the night before, so I also only had three hours Ooh. of sleep. That's right. Um, yeah, episode 26. Yes, we're halfway through a whole year. That's pretty yeah, exciting. Yeah. Um, we took a couple breaks, of course, for holidays and stuff. But uh, thank you to everyone that's been listening to us all the way, or those that have just jumped on. I had someone tell me that they uh, came on because they listened to the Jason Alt show because they were uh, Brainstorm Brewery. Brewery fans. Yeah, Very cool. <clears throat> so, yeah, we're definitely getting, uh, well, we've been getting a lot of reviews on iTunes. Thanks, everybody, for yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to announce the winners from this week's contest at the end of this show. So... Be sure to listen to the whole thing or just skip ahead now if you want. <laughs> Go, you can do either one. That's but fine. we got a good episode because today we're talking about the top 10 white cards for EDH, which is great. This one was hard. Uh-huh. I mean, red was, you know, red hasn't really changed a whole ton since alpha beta, really. Right. Um, it hasn't evolved a ton. It's pretty much still a Wait, you, you calling us... Uh... <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, what red's identity has identity, been the same yeah. uh, since the beginning. So... It doesn't have like this wide array of stuff that it can do. It's pretty right. much like damage to your face and chaotic stuff. Yeah, and uh, being very aggressive in general. But white has been all over the map in the, over the years, so there's just so many like directions to go, and it's really hard to rank them. Yeah, and there are so many angels. You have to find the best ones. There's just so many creatures that do so many disparate things that it's like, I don't know, is this ability act yeah. better than this one? It's tough because it depends on the deck. Anyway, I found it this one really tough. In Artifacts... We did was you'd think that'd be hard, but it wasn't. That was not bad, yeah. Because with artifacts, you basically have to find like you're thinking like, oh, artifacts usually do something that at least one of the colors can do. They just yeah. do it sort of slightly less efficient. So you're like, well, what's the best artifact that draws cards? What's the best artifact that does ramp? What's yeah. the, it, it? It ends up being not that difficult. But again, white. I had like forty cards on my list to yeah, begin with. My list was gigantic. Yeah, and I'm like, how do I narrow this down? So, my, that's why my honorable mentions list is so big. Because I was like, oh, this is an honorable. Yeah, mention. I noticed you cheated a lot. <laughs> you cheated a lot. I was like, well, my honorable mention list is still four cards. So, yeah, yeah that's true. it's uh. Our lists are very different this time. Yeah, I'm excited. We have a couple of shared... Actually, we've got some good stuff in we there. We have some shared ones, yeah. but I'd say not as many as the last two. Oh, yeah, definitely so. not. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about, well, A, the pre-release that we did yesterday, and we also have a couple of corrections for last week's episode. Thank you guys for uh, tweeting at us, by the way, and telling us uh, where we uh, slipped up because uh yeah the show. one thing you learn when you do a podcast is like you make mistakes because you're just yeah. talking off the cuff and then you know you learn oh that's not actually true or yeah. whoops i've said that wrong i should have read that card twice yeah so well the first question is dagatar who if you the will read adamant the adamant i uh, played him at the pre-release and he was great oh my gosh he's very good in limited yeah um so the the we didn't really make a mistake but we did fail to mention something uh dagatar i'm gonna read him again just so so that everybody is on the same page. He's three and a white for a zero zero legendary creature with vigilance. Degatar the Adamant enters the battlefield with four one one counters on it. So he's a four four to start. And then you can pay one and hybrid Golgari twice. So three mana total. So one black green. And then when you pay that, you can move a one one counter from target creature onto a second target creature. So what we failed to mention and didn't really realize honestly at the time was mm -hmm. that you can just steal counters from your opponents. Yeah. Stuff. So, which is so important and limited for sure. In limited in this limited format, especially because yeah. there's bolster, there's outlast, outlast, there's all the stuff that puts one one counters. And uh, yeah, I saw you like a dude put out an Abzan ascendancy, put one one counters on all the stuff. And you're oh like, yeah, they were all gone by the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> I looked out. at the table. He had one one counters on four guys, yeah. and then I went back to my game and looked over again, and he had no counters on his same guys. Yeah. He just had them all. So. That's pretty awesome and limited. I think we were still correct in that Degatar doesn't feel super powerful in yeah. the because Now, if you're playing against a bunch of players that love plus one, plus one counters and stuff. If they're playing an Chessa deck or an yeah. Animar deck, then... Sure, yeah, you can steal from them. Um, but my, it's three mana. Yeah. I think even in like, those decks, it'll be hard to keep up. They're still going to be able to keep some mm -hmm. of their counters. Well, they're also just better cards to put one one counters where you want them. And the, the upside of stealing someone else's pl plus one, plus one counter is probably not going to be as good as just playing a better card. 
in just a lot of games, time. there just won't be any 1-1 one, one counters on anything in the yeah. game. I mean, Not that's mention, very specific, just two types of decks, really. Yeah, and Dagger Draw dies to a lot of board wipes, whereas an enchantment that does the same thing, for instance, might not, you know, be as... It is a little more resilient, so there's just other options. But yeah, I, th I think it's still fun. It could be a fun commander, it just to really build around him and be able to swap stuff out at instant speed and, you know, really do... It, yeah, maybe I don't see it being... I still don't see it being super powerful. But anyway, yeah. I did want to make that correction because yep. uh, we hadn't mentioned it. And the other thing, which was kind of a bigger one, yes. is that, uh, although it doesn't actually apply because I don't think there's a legendary creature that has dash, mm -hmm. but we had talked about how if you paid the dash cost on something, you could get around the commander tax. Oh, it's just the uh, it's just the dragon. Oh, in, there's a legendary Dare yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, we thought that the dash cost was kind of like Dare V's. Uh, you can put them in from the command zone from wherever and, and skip play them. the and command skip tax. Yeah, you're the actually... commander tax. It's an alternate uh, casting cost, so you're still going to pay the extra if that commander dies or is put back into the command zone. Yeah, because you're still casting it, even if you're paying the dash cost. Mm -hmm. So if the commander had died... Uh, then you would still have to pay the extra yep. mana on top of the dash cost. However, so. if you do dash it out and then it goes back to your hand, then the cost goes back to normal because you're casting it from your hand and not from the command zone. Right. So, so yeah. Um, okay, so those are, we apologize. Corrections, corrections. Corrections, corrections. Um, yeah, okay. Let's All talk right. about, well, let's talk about our criteria a little bit. Uh -huh, for, that's right. I mean, we don't have necessarily the same criteria. In fact, you were recently on uh, the Masters of Modern podcast, mm -hmm. and Ben and Alex and you and you a little bit were doing the uh... very little. I, <laughs> I contribute very little to those podcasts, but I like hearing. It, it helps. If it makes me feel like, oh, now I know more about magic. <laughs> yeah, now I know more, know more about modern. Yeah. Um, so they were doing their top ten artifacts in modern, mm -hmm. and I thought it was really interesting because Ben and Alex had an interesting dynamic that I think sort of showcased why these sort of discussions kind of are interesting and they can escalate and people get really passionate about it. Yeah. Because there's a, a lot of ways to look at like what's the best quote unquote card right. or what's a better card quote unquote. And and the big one was like Darksteel Citadel versus Spellskite. <laughs> yeah. Darksteel Citadel versus Spellskite. And Alex was saying Darksteel Citadel and Ben was saying Spellskite. And it's an interesting argument. And basically their two philosophies were just different. Like Alex was mm -hmm. basically when he was ranking his artifacts, he was thinking of what's this artifact's most powerful when it's at its most powerful how powerful is it yeah and ben's take was kind of more like what is this artifact at its average in most scenarios yeah. how powerful is that which means that dark steel citadel is when it's at its average is not that great it's just a colorless land yeah but yeah. when it's its most powerful when it's in an affinity deck when mm -hmm. it's when you have not soul artifact in your deck you know then it's one of the most powerful cards in that deck yeah. and so that's just a philosophical difference that I think, you know, depending on which side you're on, it's you're going to fight for different cards. You're going to think yeah. different cards are more powerful. I still think Spell Sky's better. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sort of, I think we're both sort of more on the Ben side yeah. of that argument. I, where, I think it might be because of EDH as well, because there's no... I mean, you can make an Affinity deck in Commander, but I feel like... Well, you, you want can make an awesome, yeah, I feel like Spell Sky deck. just fits in every... You can put a Spell Sky in every single See, deck. See, again, now we're you're on the side of the argument of Ben's, which yeah. is like, yeah, that is more useful in more decks, therefore I rank it as more powerful. Yep, but yep. I can see Alex's side, which oh, is yeah. like, oh, yeah, but... When this card is powerful, yeah. it, it, it's way more powerful than Spell Sky. I mean, when you can play it as like a four of and, and hit Metalcraft really early because of those artifact lands, yeah. and that's, yeah, that's super powerful. But I, but we're, I think philosophically, we're mostly the same, which is yeah. like, we like the, I want to, I want the card to be ranked on what it is in an average scenario, not in the yeah. best case scenario. And that is one of our criteria. So the first one that we usually talk about is mana cost. So if it's super high up there or it's very prohibitive, like it's like got five white mana symbols in there, then. It's that not doesn't mean it can't be on the list. It just right. means it's... It's something it's it's to take not, against it, yeah. 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 Uh, and then the other one, of course, is how useful is it in a multitude of decks and colors. Right. So if it's a very narrow strategy, that doesn't... Again, doesn't mean it can't be on the list. It just means that it sort of gets knocked down a peg yeah. or two. Yeah. Uh, quadrant theory, which is something that we learned from limited resources. I'll go over that really quickly. Quadrant theory is basically how well a card performs in four stages of the game. In development, when you're at board parity, uh, you guys are sort of just looking, staring at each other and things happening. When you're losing, uh, which I think is the most important, and when you're winning. Yeah, and, you, and we really went into this <clears throat> in our episode with uh, Marshall Sutcliffe from Limited Resources. He came on the show and really, mm -hmm. and really broke down uh, the quadrant theory. And it's a very interesting way to just look at card evaluation. Yeah. Um, so I think no matter, even if you're not ranking uh, <clears throat> cards like we are, that's a good way to sort of yeah. figure out you know, 
is a card good in your deck is to look at the quadrant theory. So that's think, episode nine also, if you haven't listened to it. Yeah, we talk about Animar. And I think a, a big novice mistake in uh, Commander is that you put too many cards that are good when you're winning. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, great. Yeah, overkill, overkill, overkill. Yeah. Clear of Behemoth all the time. Well, it's like we were talking about, too. There's a there's something called best-case scenario mentality. That's also uh, yeah. Marshall's talked about a lot on his show. And it's just like thinking of the card only when you know it's in its best case. But really, you want to think of a card also when it's in its worst, worst case. yeah. So, because often you're going to draw the card and it's, you know, you're not going to have your commander out and you're not mm-hmm. going to have six cards in your hand and you're not going to have all the <clears> land <throat> you want and you're not going to have the other piece of the combo. Then how good is that card? Yeah, by itself. Yeah, exactly. So that's something to think about. Um, and the last one is sort of, does the card either enable or fight strategies which are prevalent in EDH? So what are prevalent EDH strategies? You know, token strategies, yep. Voltron strategies, lots of board wipes. <laughs> you know, those are just things that are very prevalent. Um, you know, lots of card draw, lots of mana ramp. Those are the things that, you know, most EDH decks do, or you're going to see those things yeah. often. And so if you're going to come up against something often, then it's more important that you have either something to fight it or something that does that So yeah. or enables that. So. Uh, yeah, that's sort of the the criteria we use. All right. Um, well, let's get into you it. Start with number ten. Yeah. All right. All right. You go first. My number ten is a little card called Mentor of the Meek. Mentor of the Meek. So Mentor of the Meek is a. Uh, it's essentially it's like card draw yep. for white. That it doesn't white doesn't have too much card draw. White's and, actually maybe the worst color at card draw. Yeah, and Mentor of the Meek I think is is one of the better um, cards for that. It is a little limited. I'll read it. So it's two in the white for a two two creature hum, human soldier. Whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay one mana. If you do, draw a card. So white is also sort of the king of the small creatures, right? So white weenies. white weenies, yeah, yeah, white weenies been around since alpha. So mm-hmm. um, this sort of synergizes well with itself in that white's going to often have a lot of smaller creatures, utility creatures, and yeah. then when you play them, you pay one extra mana, and you draw cards. You know, you draw an extra card. Yeah. So this doesn't work terribly well if you just have huge creatures in your deck, obviously. Um, it's not necessarily for every deck, but it is very yeah. powerful in the decks. Yeah, and I think card draws really is something that white needs in a like sort of in a shell so that's why i have mentor of the meek up there i like it i think one of the things too also comes out very early yeah it comes out early i think also one of white's you know white's color pie is pretty wide but one of the things it's really good at is token generating Mm -hmm. and notice that mentor for the meek doesn't say non-token creature so that's very when you play a card that that puts like you know even just raise the alarm which is a crappy card but just for an example it's two mana and you get two one one uh creatures out of it well, those can each trigger Mentor for the Meek. Mm-hmm. So anytime you make tokens, you can draw cards. And and White has a lot of like just pay three mana, make a token. Well, that means pay four mana, yeah, make a token, draw, draw a card. card. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so <laughs> that's pretty good. That's why I think Mentor for the Meek. Yeah, it's a very <clears throat> good card. Ironically, I don't have it on my list, and here I am just talking good about it. But you it's know. your uh, honorable mention. You can <laughs> say I made it there, right? <laughs> um, okay, so my number 10 is Blind Obedience. Ooh la la. Uh, we talked about this before in the Overperformers episode. It's yeah. one in a white for an enchantment. It has extort. That's not important, so I'm not going to read it. What it says is, artifacts and creatures your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. Ugh. It and- feels, you know, there's a, there's a few other cards, Kismet, there's a few others. Mm-hmm. Some affect you also, some don't. But this is sort of the best one, I think, because it's the cheapest. And it yeah, has it extort on, on top two. of it, which oh my gosh. extort is useful. It's just not why the card's good. Yeah. Um, extort allows you, anytime you cast a spell, you can pay a white or a black, and you can everybody loses a life and you gain a life. Yeah, you can do it one time <clears throat> per spell. Yeah, which is not why the card's good. <laughs> Making all your opponent's stuff, artifacts and creatures, come into play tapped, it just slows them down, gives you time to react to what it they're doing. It time walks them like Sometimes. the whole term, yeah. Because if they have like a soul ring, it's like, oh, it comes in play taps. Yep. So now that ramp I had to make something huge. At least has for to that the turn. turn. Yeah. Is, yeah, exactly. But also like token strategies that just put out like 20 guys and try to attack you with it. Right. You know, or um, stuff like infinite combos, Kiki Jiki, Pestermite, you know, Splinter Twin, Midnight Guard, yep. crap like that. That if all the creatures they're making come into play tap, that doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, just Voltron strategies. How often is a Voltron strategy like, Play my general, swift foot boots, swing, kill you. Yeah. Like that happens a lot, especially later on in games where they're like, they got their four equipment out and they've mm-hmm. got, you know, two exalted dudes. And it's like, well, as soon as he plays his commander, somebody's dead, <laughs> you know? And it's like, nope, because it comes into play tapped. Yeah. So that just stops all the haste effects. And haste is a huge part of EDH. So, um, yeah, this is a really 
uh, it's an innocuous card, but... Well, the fact that it costs two is also incredible because it comes yeah. out in turn two and it's affecting the board for the, the rest game. of the game. Yeah, or as long as it doesn't get removed. And it's also not that terrible that people want to get rid of it immediately because it's just like, all right, fine, one turn. That's actually a really good point. And I if think, it was if it stayed tapped, then people yeah, would hate you. And I think you. you know our criteria didn't list this, but but this time I was thinking about because white has a mm-hmm. lot of cards that are pretty mean. Yeah. And you know I think another thing that has to be factored into the equation of how good the card is is in EDH specifically is how much hate does it does it cause right among the table because there's some very good cards, but man, as soon as you play it, everyone wants to kill you, and that mm-hmm. that should count. That should knock the card down a little bit. Blind obedience does stuff, but it doesn't actually make people that angry. Yeah. It's just like, ah, oh, that's a little annoying. Yeah. Unless you start extorting everything, then I'm like, why Why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> but even then, it's like one damage at a time. It doesn't... Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. My number nine is a Planeswalker. The only Planeswalker I have on this list, actually. Um, and it also sort of falls into the white weenie category, but it is my favorite Elspeth. It's Sun's Champion. She's four and two white for a uh, four loyalty planeswalker with three great abilities. The first one is put three one one white soldier creatures tokens onto the battlefield for her plus one. Now, if you guys know the other Elspeth, uh, I believe it was Elspeth Terrell did the same thing for minus two. So she comes down on the board. She immediately protects herself, and that's one of the most important things with a planeswalker. Her minus three is destroy all creatures of power four or greater. So if you're playing a white weenie strategy, then Elspeth is also very powerful in that regard because your guys usually will not get affected by her board wipe. Um, actually, do many other planeswalkers even have board wipes? Uh, Elspeth actually does on some of her other incarnations. Right, incarnations. Ugin we know does. Right, There's a right. few others, the two. Uh, and then her minus seven, which uh, you probably won't get to, is that you get an emblem with creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and have flying. So this is sort of still in the realm of the white weenie. Um, uh, because I just think that's one of the best ways to really take advantage of White's cards is by playing to their strengths, which She's is... She's amazing with Mentor for the Meek. Right? You do a plus one, pay three mana, you get three cards. That's crazy. Yeah, I was going to mention that. That's that's <laughs> great. So I really like Elspeth. She's one of my favorite Planeswalkers. Um, and I think really the most important thing for this is that she can put out blockers for herself. You know, it's interesting because something I debated and was on my list for a long time and eventually uh, got knocked off the list was actually Elspeth Knight Errant. Oh, right. Which is very similar. Her plus one puts only one white soldier creature token onto the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has another plus one, which is target creature, creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains flying. And then I won't even talk about her ultimate because that's not why I had yeah. her on the list. But the reason I had her a little above Sun's Champion, because they were both neck and neck. and A bit cheaper. Was, a bit cheaper. She's two and, and two white. And also, I thought her plus one worked really well in Voltron strategies. Like in Oh, right, because she has two plus ones, and you can, yeah. Yeah, well, and it's like plus three, plus three, and flying yeah. can be big if you're also giving the creature double strike or something like that, which, right. are, which a lot of Voltron strategies right. do. This Elspeth with Rafik is just nuts. Broken. I mean, yeah. you can literally like, oh, I've got Elspeth out. Play Rafik. It's pretty easy to kill somebody right there. Yeah, you can hit for at least 16 commander. Yeah, you only need one more equipment maybe to put you into 21 yeah. instant death. So anyway, interesting. Uh, I like both of them. Uh, Sun's Champion, super powerful. I mean, just making three guys every turn. is like Yeah, I mean, if you let that get out of control, then it, it's... I don't think there's much more efficient token generation than that. That you can guarantee every turn. I mean, right. sometimes I mean, like, if, I think, if you have doubling season parallel lives, yeah. I mean, you're going to be in a token dedicated token. I think deck a lot Michael of time. Loth is like the closest in terms of being able to pump out a ton of dudes. But yeah, I, I really, I really and like she that. She has Elspeth. the board wipe honor, which is like mm-hmm. you know we know board wipes in EDH is super super powerful, and it's all, uh, actually like a potential one sided board wipe because destroy yep. all creatures with power four or greater. That means you know if you build your deck in a way that that doesn't hit you, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you're in like in Garrick's Wake territory, you know, or, or Cyclonic Rift territory. Yeah, everyone else keeps their weenies, which aren't going to be able to swing in and kill her anyway, and you get rid of the most significant creatures on the board, which oftentimes is, like, everyone's general. So, yeah. heck, I'll take it. Um, my number nine is a card we've talked about many times. It's Sarah Ascendant. Oh, boy. Sarah Ascendant is a super powerful EDH card. It's one white. For... It used to be a terrible card, right? Yeah, it was a very bad card until EDH I mean, came you around. could build around it in standard or whatever to yeah, try but it and was get a bad life. idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's one white for a 1-1 one, one with lifelink. Boo. But it has additional text. Oh. <laughs> as long as you have 30 or more life, Sarah Ascendant gets plus five, plus five, and has flying. 
Oh. So in EDH, it's the <laughs> most efficient creature of all time. Yeah, it's, it's a, a one white for a six six flying lifelinker on turn one. Yeah, that's the, busted. Even on turn three, four, it's very very good mm -hmm. uh, because you play it for one white mana. And no one's going to be able to trump that. You do something else. You know, you put a sort of light and shadow on it or yeah. something. You know, like it's very 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 powerful. Uh, but really, it, the the games where you played on turn one, like somebody's just dead. Somebody at the table, yeah. like EDH decks aren't as fast as other formats. Like most of the time, you know, unless somebody has like a path to exile in hand right now. Right. Yeah. It's it's. I well, mean, you I, get her out, and then if you throw down an equipment on her too, and yeah, and it's just, just like brutal. it gets yeah, it gets very brutal. We very played fast. a game against our friend Matt Arnold once, <laughs> and it was three player, and he got Sarah sending out turn one. So he actually soul ring turn two, uh, got a sword, sword of, of light and a shadow, yeah. and literally killed both of us before we could do much. <laughs> Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, I play a mana dork. Yeah, and, and you're like, and I'm dead. Her. And then I was like, I have two more turns. Oh, God. Yeah, Matt I do had something? like 87 life or something yeah. ridiculous by the end. Yeah, that was great. So, um, very powerful card. Uh, yeah. I noticed it's actually a little higher on your list. Yeah, it is just because I don't have as many as I, I have like three white decks, and uh -huh. I would love to have. I have one Sarah Ascendant. So, maybe <laughs> that's why I put it just a little bit higher. <laughs> I actually only have Sarah Ascendant in one deck. Oh, really? I own a couple of them, but yeah, I only have it in one. But it's just. It's, it's so powerful. Maybe. Yeah, I'll just give it to you if you yeah, want. All right. Oh, thanks, man. That's that command zone spirit, guys. <laughs> we have these uh, Google Docs, by the way, uh, that are just giant lists of cards that we've just lent each other and just given to each other. But I never even look at it. I'm yeah, like, no, I was just, hey, I'm just like, just whatever. You can have it. We'll it's, figure it out. Yeah, if, if I really need that card, yeah, then I'll you send just, you a text. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, to number eight. I'm going to go first this time. Sure. Number eight, I have Elish Norn. Oh. Grand Cenobite. You know, it's funny. A dude just played this on me last night at the pre-release we were playing. Oh, right. Game. His Carador deck. Yeah. It is the deck to play this card. By yeah. The way. That, that deck of all the decks plays Elish Norn. Uh, that, I, I actually think Elish Norn belongs in a lot of white decks. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Let like, me read another really white quick. weenie strategy. <laughs> yeah. Let me read her really quick. She's expensive. Uh, well, she's expensive money-wise, but she's also expensive mana-wise. <laughs> she's five and two white for a legendary creature, a four seven, which is weird. Uh, she has Vigilance, because with these other abilities, she wasn't powerful enough to <laughs> give her Vigilance. Um, it says, other creatures you control get plus two, plus two. If you just stop there, I'd be down. That's pretty good. Four, yeah. seven, Vigilance. Uh, that gives all your creatures plus two, plus two. Yeah. But she's got more. This is the kicker. Creatures your opponents control get negative two, negative two. Oh, my gosh. It's crazy. Yeah, That's that a four is power and toughness swing between your creatures and theirs plus it just outright kills uh, so a much ton yeah so often you drop elish norn and it's basically a board wipe mm -hmm. for everybody else well not just that it's a board wipe for like everyone's really useful creatures yeah but and all your creatures just get huge mm -hmm. yeah i i there's very few games where you see elish norn come down and it doesn't just immediately like drastically affect the board to yeah. the point where like somebody's basically dead um because you usually drop it and then you swing with your dudes and all of a sudden they lost all their guys yeah it's it's a pretty you know this card is very very powerful. She's also got the coolest hat of all time. I know she's not on your list at all. I you know what I think it's a mistake. I think I should have put her on there. It's you hard though. I'm looking at all your cards and I'm like, well, I should have put those on there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny because when we first started talking about this list, I was like, well, Elish Norn and Sarah Sinden have to be on there, and <laughs> Elish Norn didn't make my list at all. Dude, you better watch out. She's got that scary hat and she's coming after you. No, she is coming after me. She's scary like, headpiece, I suppose. You know, I feel like she's blind. She's got that hat on. She can't see. She doesn't see. have to see you. She just gives everybody in her area a negative two. Yeah. Negative two. Maybe she just has a really good sense of smell. Maybe you're bigger than a 2-2 two -two creature, Jimmy, and you're okay. Oh, thank God. I, said, <laughs> I, I, I hope I'm like... I said maybe. I'll, you know what? I'll be a 1-3. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll barely survive. I like your high opinion of yourself. <laughs> I mean, I've got a head cold right now. I'm definitely not more than a one. <laughs> All right, uh, my number eight, which I think is higher up on your list, and it, maybe it does deserve a higher spot, uh, is Land Tax. And Ooh, yeah. aside from having the worst art of all time... Come on, it's awesome. It's a, it's it's the Sheriff of Nottingham or something. <laughs> yeah, how does he have two rings on his middle finger? How does that even work? Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, the Oracle Text, because this is an older card, it's a, it's a one white mana for an enchantment. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library up to three for up to three basic land cards, reveal them, and put them into your hand. If you do, shuffle your library. So it's an opponent. An opponent. Anyone on the so table. So if and one person on the table has more lands than you. Mm -hmm. 
Also, is, a trick with is, land tax is you just don't play a land one turn. Yeah, just this to is turn the card. You just wait. You're like, all right, land tax, turn one. And then you like have one round go by. I'm like, great. Now I never have to worry about lands for the rest of the game. Yeah, I'm going to draw as many lands as um, I can. It's pretty... I mean, this is... It's so powerful. Because if someone like plays an explore or exploration, you're like, oh, sweet, land tax is going to go to town. Yep. Um, it drastically thins your deck. It, this isn't. This is actually, I think, significant. If every turn you're taking three extra cards out of your deck, yeah, and you're going to be drawing gas a lot. It more is often. drawing cards. Mm -hmm. Like that's the thing. White doesn't draw cards. It is drawing cards. Now it's not drawing spells, but yeah, those are still cards. I mean, you know, yeah. You also have to watch out if you're uh, if you don't have any basic lands in your deck. Like you couldn't play this in your five color deck. No, yeah, you can't. You yeah. can't play it in necessarily every deck, but most decks will have some basic yeah. lands. But the thing is, for one white mana, if even if you just trigger this twice, it's totally worth That's it. Six cards. Six cards. You're gonna, you you guarantee that you have the right mana <laughs> and you have enough mana for yeah. the game. Let's yeah, it's super powerful. I have it actually really high up. Uh, I have yeah. it as my number three. Um, I might have to reconsider. I might need to move up a little bit because this. Now that I'm looking at this card, maybe the art threw me off. <laughs> it's got horrible <laughs> art. Well, there is downsides to the card, though. Yeah. Um, if you draw it on turn six or seven, it's probably not going to do a lot for you at mm -hmm. that point. You know, but even then, you're going to still... Often in EDH, you want to get to your 10th, 11th, 12th land drop. Um, yeah, it's true. But, you know, there will be times in the game where, yeah, drawing land doesn't... And this is just drawing you a lot of land. Yeah, and but, sometimes you do turn it off as well. Yeah, um, that's and, true. Uh, and also, other people can force you to turn it off by them not playing a land. That's true. If you're playing so against somebody kind of who's got... Out. Yeah, exactly. Somebody who's got ways or, or uses for getting rid of their own land, they yeah. can get, get below you and then... Yeah. So, it's not always awesome, but when it's... But it, but at its average, it's very powerful. Yeah, it is. It is very powerful. I, I definitely am a big fan of land tax. Uh, okay, number seven. Well, let's let you go because my number seven is Sarah Ascendant. Sarah Ascendant, so good. Yeah, uh, we already talked about it, of course. So let's go to your number seven. My number seven is Enlightened Tutor. Ah, now this is a card. White has a couple of tutors, and we always talk about tutors because they are incredibly powerful. Yeah, they are essentially a card in your deck that you want at any time. It's like a double of any card that it qualifies for. Um, an Enlightened Tutor, it is card disadvantage. Well, let me read it. It's mm -hmm. uh, one white for an instant. It says, search your library for an artifact or enchantment, important that it's both, mm -hmm. and reveal that card. Shuffle your library, then put that card on top of it. So it is card disadvantage because you use a card, but then you still have to draw, draw the, the card that turn. you found. But in EDH, like... You right. You built your deck with a lot of card draw, yeah. right? Like we've been talking about that for like twenty five episodes. So <laughs> I hope you did. So usually, uh, being down a card is not too important. You have other cards, that and make at up instant for it. speed, you're going to do it at the you end step at the before end you step, turn. Yeah, and then or you you say I would do this during the end step. But I'm going to save time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do it, it now. We, yeah, we do that all the time. Um, but like tutors, extremely powerful, and white is mm -hmm. the sort of the enchantment color like yeah. that they're the best at enchantments they have a lot of enchantments that do crazy stuff now that's debatable but i would say i think white no i think you're right in that case because uh, white also has a lot of enchantment matters cards like right. idyllic tutor is just yep. an enchantment a lot of tutor. stuff that gets specifically enchantments back from the graveyard mm -hmm. the fact that this says artifact also though yeah. is really what put it up like idyllic tutor there's a few others they don't also they don't get both. Mm -hmm. So getting an artifact and there's so many powerful artifacts, especially if you're in white. Like yeah. let's say you're in mono white. Well, you might need card draw. Well, your card draw is going to be like Mind's Eye, yeah, or an artifact, or a scroll rack, or something. Yeah, so you're going to need to go get that. So it's or just, even just getting a soul ring with this is perfectly acceptable. Yeah. You know? Yep. Or go just go getting a piece of your combo or something that, you know, mm -hmm. or an equipment or there's a million things you might want to go get. I just yeah. this card is very, very it's actually I think it's dropped in price recently. I'm really? not sure why, but yeah, I feel oh, like it's it, so good. Yeah. I, I recently just bought like five or six of them because nice. I was like, well, every white deck I have puts this in. Yeah. It, being able to fetch an enchantment too is great because there are so many enchantments that are responses yeah. in my deck to other decks. Like Aura Shards is a card I play a lot yep, of because yep. if you don't have something to get rid of other stuff, then you know, you're gonna be a big trouble so and especially like you wouldn't necessarily want a bunch of cards that do what aura shards does because mm -hmm. sometimes you don't need it yeah but when you do need it you really need you it really so what need enlightened it, yeah. tutor allows you to do is be like oh i have aura shards i got blind obedience i've got you know ghostly prison and i don't i only need one of those yeah well enlightened tutor lets you go find the one you need when you need it yep yeah not to mention being a being just one mana means you can hold open the mana for this at any time very easily yeah, yeah. all right uh moving on to number six uh, oh, we have the exact same number six. Oh, look at that. Look at that. I guess um, 
that is empirical evidence. That's scientific <laughs> that this is the number six most powerful white card in EDH. Just, of all time. Yeah, yeah. See? All yeah. time. Uh, <laughs> it would be the one and only Big Mama, Avison, Angel of Hope. Big Mama. <laughs> Big Mama. <laughs> Can I call her? I'm just calling her Big Mama from now on. Big Mama Angel of Hope. Does she make chicken and waffles? <laughs> <laughs> no, but she. Well, I guess she does, but you can't eat them because they're indestructible. <laughs> that was because uh, if anybody's been to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles in uh, LA, yep. Big Mama is. Big Mama, yeah. <laughs> she's a she's a staple. Uh, um, she's also a big mama because she costs eight converted mana cost, which is five and three white. So it's a lot, but it's it is. prohibitive if you're not. Uh, a strongly white deck, but by the time you're able to cast this, you should have the white mana for it. Just one Gilded Lotus, you're good. Yeah, exactly. Um, or one Kalia. There you go. <laughs> so, Avacyn Angel of Hope, uh, eight mana total, five and three white. She has Flying and Vigilance, and essentially she has Undestructible because other permanents you control have Indestructible, and she's an 8-8. Eight, eight. Well, Avacyn and other permanents yeah. you control have Indestructible. So, she's yeah. Indestructible. And she's an 8-8 eight, eight Flyer with Vigilance. Yeah, that's, that's pretty... It's Pretty incredible. Powerful. <laughs> it's incredible. For one, she's an 8-8 flyer with Vigilance. Yeah. So that's just crazy powerful right there. But yeah. making all your stuff indestructible. Yeah, that's insane. She's one of those cards. She hits the table and everybody just looks around at everybody else like, you got something for that? You, you got, got something, something for that? that? What you do got you got? Yeah. I mean, You're you like, get... I got a board wipe. Oh, wait. Yeah. No. Nope. I mean, you need exile target whatever mm -hmm. or, you know, something Or a talk crazy. effect or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she really enables you to play creature decks. You know, there's mm -hmm. a... Creature decks are just hard to play in EDH because there's so many board wipes that it's just yeah. hard. But, you know, you need a bunch of Angel of yeah, Avacyns and stuff like that to sort of, like, make yourself uh, immune to the board wipes. Yeah, not to mention this just, this secures your board. Like, you can, now, if you want to start attacking, like, go for it. You're not going to yeah. lose anybody. Like, yeah. people are going to be forced to make blocks, and even if they make blocks that are good for them, they're still probably going to take damage, and your creatures aren't going anywhere. I mean, she's good. I even have her in, like, my Flicker deck. Oh, nice. So you can because save her if someone tries to... I just want my stuff to not be able to be removed. Right. You know? And board wipes still hurt the flicker deck, because usually, you know, they board wipe and you flicker out two two things. But, but you still you lose might a have bunch. five things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But Avacyn makes it very, very hard. And then if they manage to try and get rid of her, you can flicker her. Right. And, you know, she's she's really powerful in a lot of situations, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, Avacyn, I think she kind of... She speaks for herself. Uh Big the, Mama. Big Mama. Um, definitely the best card to put in a Kalia deck because if Kalia swings and Avacyn comes out, it's... Oh, man. You just win. You just win, yeah. It's you're the doing, worst. You're doing 10 damage <laughs> off that swing alone. and she. <laughs> but the funny thing with Kalia is that <laughs> Avacyn actually comes in tapped when you play her with Kalia because that's right, right, right. Kalia's Tapped text. and attacking. Yeah, yeah it's the only time she's ever going to get tapped, essentially. <laughs> uh, right. Okay, on to number five. For number five, I have Humility. Nice. Humility is an enchantment. It costs two and two white. It says, all creatures lose all abilities and have base power and toughness one, one. Oh, that is humility indeed. This is in a lot of ways better than a board wipe. Mm -hmm. Because you wipe the board and so many decks just have a way to like, oh, get my stuff out of my graveyard. Yeah. Or it sends the, uh, the generals, the commanders to the command zone because you mm -hmm. killed them. This doesn't do that. Those things just turn into 1-1s. One they yeah. can't put them in the command zone. They don't get to get them back out of their graveyard. Yeah, they're just sitting there as 1-1s. One and anything, and if you board wipe, they go, okay, it's, of course, it kind of sucks, but then they play their next creature, and it's still what it is, but yeah. not with humility out. You play your creature, and it's a 1-1. One, one. You play Gaddick Teague. He doesn't do anything. He's a 1-1. <laughs> one, one. He doesn't stop everything that he's supposed yeah. to stop. You play, you know, Avacyn. She doesn't have any text. Mm -hmm. She's... Just a 1-1 one, one creature. Unless face. someone removes this enchantment, everything yep. is a 1-1. One, one. And if you're playing a white weenie deck and you have, like, Marshall's Anthem or things that buff your creatures, then you are going to be benefiting off of this more than everyone else because you're already putting out, like, 1-1 one, one tokens or whatever. Yeah, so. exactly. So you're And your your cards don't have abilities text, mm -hmm. and they're not 2-2s two or 3-3s yeah, or 8-8s. But eight they eights. do keep their creature types, Yep. and I believe they keep their colors. Yeah. So if you're playing a white weenies deck and you're a soldier tribal deck, then you're still in business. Yep. So this, and I put this in a lot of decks that just don't have a lot of creatures. Mm -hmm. You know, the Nekusar deck. Oh, right. Yeah, now, this yeah. would turn Nekusar himself into a 1-1 one -one with no abilities, but... But there's so many other things Underworld you're doing. Underworld Dream still works. Yeah. You know, those kind of things, like, there's still a lot of ways to kill them that aren't creature-based. The Howling Mine is still Howling. Yeah, Howling Mine is still Howling. Yeah, this is a super powerful card. It just kills creature decks. It just yeah. shuts down creature decks. I'm a big except for token decks. 
Yeah. If you play, but even then, to- if the token decks are based around having other creatures being the guys yeah, that buff true. them, like Prosh, it would hurt a lot. Yeah, exactly. Although his coat of arms still is pretty good. Oh right. <laughs> Yeah, so it's an enchantment that kills all the creatures. So if you're enchantment heavy or artifact heavy, then you're going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, my number five is Oblation. Oh, yeah. It's a two and a white for an instant, and it is white's version of uh, Chaos Warp. Uh, the owner of target non-land permanent shuffles it into his or her library, then draws two cards. So they get the whoever uh, loses the permanent, still gets a benefit by drawing two cards, but you can essentially tuck a commander this way. You can get rid of the most problematic thing. Um, there is a chance that they'll draw it again. Super small chance. Um, there also is a chance that you cast this on your own thing, so yep. you can just draw two cards for three, uh, yep. which is like a divination. Yep. Um, you lose, like I don't know, like a token or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just very utility. It's instant speed. It's something that decks often need to deal with big threats. And there's, like we've often said, there's so many decks where if their commander is tucked into their library that deck just is doing nothing. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you have a Jaleva deck, <laughs> oh, God. that deck just can't <laughs> function without its commander. Yeah, or Narset or that, yeah. yeah. So, Or if someone plays Humility on you, you got to get rid of it. Oblation. Yeah, true. Yeah, because yeah. it gets rid of any non-land permanent. So, yeah, super, super powerful. Yeah, this is a EDH staple. Ironically, I don't have it on my list again. But... It's on your honorable mentions, right? It's always on, you know, if it's not on the <laughs> list, it's, it's on the honorable mentions. It was on the list of stuff I wanted to put on there, but I only had 10 slots, so... <laughs> All right. Um, you want to do no- your number four? Yes. My number four is the... It's funny. I put these same two cards together also. Yeah. But they're very similar. Uh, they have. They essentially do the same thing in they're a lot of ways. They're the best uh, single target removal spells yes. in the history of the game. It would be swords to plowshares or plowshares. I have no idea how to say it. And swords to plowshares. Plowshares. What does that even mean? Um, in the old days, uh, they would call the peasants to war, right? Uh-huh. Like um, during the Crusaders, dark, dark Ages times. Right. And they would literally be not trained fighters, and they would just give them swords. Swords. And then they would go out and fight. And then after the the battle, and in the old days, you know, the battles were like a day or a couple days, and mm-hmm. then they would go back to Farming. farmers. And so they'd put down their swords and pick up their plowshares. And Oh, swords to plowshares. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, a little swords history lesson. Yeah, that was nice. That was not exactly. I would. I'm, I know history buffs out there are like, that's not what the art is. Yeah, <laughs> I was just truncating it for the... Yeah, you know. that makes the art, uh, the newer art from Conspiracy for Swords of Plushes that much more cool. Come on, the original art is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I like the original art Drawn too because the, like guy, the guy is like, re- he's like ready to farm again. <laughs> he's like, oh boy, back, uh, lost an arm, but I'm ready to farm. Um, wow, that, that was a good poem. Yeah, it rhymes. Lost an arm, but I'm ready to farm. <laughs> magic the Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that magic. Okay, anyway, let's read it. Yeah, Swords of Plushes and Path to Exile are both one mana for an instant that starts with the text Exile Target Creature. Now, in Swords of Plowshares' case, it says its controller gains life equals to its power, so there is a upside for that, but right. life gain, as we've talked about, is not particularly relevant in EDH for the most part. And I mean, pe- if you want to kill a creature like an Avacyn, you don't care if they gain eight life. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's just like, You're like, I gotta, that creature, creature's just gotta go. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, kill, exile a creature. Exile, yeah, yeah. that's that's, that's why I can get Avacyn. Yeah, and yeah, if these were just straight kill spells, they wouldn't make the list. Like, if we did a top ten blacklist, I don't think, you know, like a Doomblade would make that list. Right. Because these exile creatures, it's that much more significant. And um, they're only one mana, which is a yeah. huge thing. And Path to Exile, uh, I think, is that a Johnny getting exiled? It does look like a Johnny. Poor a Johnny. Or one of his friends. It's probably just his like younger nephew. <laughs> Pretty sure it is. That sounds even more sad, because the Johnny's like, I lost my nephew. And Johnny's like, off screen right now going, no! Or he's like, you have done the clan wrong, and he exiles his nephew. Um, uh, a Johnny, he, he is white. Yeah. So, okay. so on the other side of Path to Exile, it says, uh, exile target creature, and its controller may search his or her library for a basic land card and put that bout card on the battlefield tapped, then shuffle their library. So you ramp them by one. You ramp them. But again, like if it's like, kill Avis and give them a land, I'd be like, yep, all day. All day. All day, all yeah. Day. Also, if it's Avacyn, they already have eight mana. Yeah. So the ninth man isn't that big. Yeah, a deal. exactly. I mean, when the times when you don't want to path to exile are like turn three or four, because it's a much bigger difference to ramp them, uh, you know, an extra turn ahead in mana mm-hmm. on turn two or three than it is on turn eight or nine. And yeah. most of the time in EDH, nobody's playing threatening two and three drops. So you're only path to exiling the six, seven, eight, nine cost casting cost stuff. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that extra land, I, path to exile is. Borderline better than Swords of Plowshares. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, but the fact that you can put both in your deck is great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, not many cards are able to exile just like that. And that's what makes both these cards very powerful. I actually have this much, well, not much higher, just too higher. I have it as number two on my list. Nice. Um, 
Yeah, these are <clears throat> almost every deck with white will want both of these cards. Yeah. Almost. Um, all right, my number four. Oh, this is a this is gonna be a little bit of a controversial one. I agree, though. I think this <clears throat> is a very powerful card. Oh, this is one of the most powerful cards in the history, like <clears throat> objectively powerful cards in the yeah. history of Magic. It would have to be on the list in contention for the most just pure power pure power card. yeah it's also just one of the greatest wipes it's also maybe the most hated card oh yeah i bet people are already like oh i know exactly what they're gonna say yeah it's armageddon armageddon is three and a white for a sorcery it's very simple it says destroy all lands this uh, is that rough. card that people specifically point to as the card they hate the most <laughs> in edh and i agree i'm not i'm not condoning playing it necessarily um, I actually only have it in a single deck, uh, and that deck is the Nekusar deck, and that yeah. deck, if you get like the a couple things set up and you arm again, you just win because they can't play cards, yeah, but so they have to draw cards so they die. Um, but people I think what makes people mad about this card specifically is when people do it, but they don't have the effects to back it up. So what it does is it just sort of it like, just sort of wipes the board and it, everyone it makes sits it there just going. makes everybody sit there and draw cards and play lands again and do nothing, yeah. And, you know, that's not fun. It's it's more fun. It's okay, I think, if you play Armageddon and that is a win condition in your deck. Like, yep. that's causing you to win. It's not so much fun when you play it and that you don't have... Yeah. yeah. Well, I already said it. If you play Armageddon and you don't win within, like, two turns, <laughs> then you're a bad person. Yeah. I mean... At least you're not going to win in two turns. Yeah. I think if you play Armageddon and you would win, but then they go, oh, in response, I kill these two things. And then you're like, uh, oh, crap. And it's like, sorry, everyone. Yeah, but that's not my fault. That's a dude that killed yeah. the two things. <laughs> uh, you know, I was going to win. Yeah, it's it's very hard to recover from Armageddon. Um, yeah, because especially if you know you have it in your hand, you can do things like, oh, I'll just not play out my 12th, 13th, and 14th land. Right, so you can get So I at least have uh, three land in my hand, because mm -hmm. when I play Armageddon, everybody usually looks at their hand and they go, I got one land. Yeah, I would I never keep lands. this. I would mulligan this hand if yeah. I, we were starting the game over. Everyone so, with the Guild of Lotus feels a little better, though. Yeah, Soul Rings, Soul Guild of Lotus. Yeah. And again, if you have Armageddon in your deck, you have more mana rocks yeah. than they do. I think so. the best way to play this card is to float all the mana in one of your main phases, yeah. and then play Armageddon and hopefully have enough past that to, you know, get to whatever you need to do to win the game. Yeah, or you have Guild... Yeah, it does suck when somebody's just... That's their plan. They're like, I'm an Armageddon, <laughs> and I have Guild Lotus and Soul Ring. That's like, well... Yeah, five mana? So you're going to play a creature. We're all going to do nothing. Then you're going to play another creature, attack somebody. Like, you're not going to ding somebody for five to the win, are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway... But ob as far as just objectively powerful on its own, it does one of the most powerful things you can do in the game. Mm -hmm. I feel bad. My number three is your number one. I've stolen two of your picks so far. Three of your picks. Yeah, you're... Um, I've actually stolen all three of your top three. That's because your top two aren't even on my list. I know, so that is So you were able strange. to bump every, all, all my high stuff. Anyway, it's well, fine. It's fine? Okay. Well, well, let's just... We okay, could, let's we save. could skip number three. Okay, we'll skip yeah, your yeah. number three. Because your number... I, so it, we have some suspense, and I have something to talk about. Yeah, there you go. All right, so we'll talk about... talk about your cards. <laughs> so Josh's number three is Land Tax. Actually, all the rest of my list have been on your list already. Yeah, except for the... Yeah, there you go. Um, so let's just move to my number two. Oh, yeah, my number is, three is Land Tax, yeah. Um, and I don't know if this actually... Usually we try and keep the cards under $30. This might be the only one that goes above that. Elish Norn might be above that. Yeah, Elish... I think Elish might be right at the edge, actually. She might be like 27, 25, yeah. yeah. Um, my number two is Linvala, Keeper of Silence. She's bonkers, and part of it's her casting cost. Yeah, she Go costs ahead. four mana for a 3-4 legendary creature flying. Oh my god, you should make her a general. That's mean. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a Linvala dex. Uh, activated abilities of creatures your opponents control can't be activated. Yeah, she's two and a white. Yeah, that's... 3-4 flyer, that's great anyway. Yeah, so four mana total for that effect on well, something... Well, she shuts off... Like, all utility creatures. Not yeah. all, but it's just activated stuff. Think of my Tim deck. Can't do anything. Yeah. Just done. Think of Kiki Jiki. Yeah. Done. Yeah. There's Triggered so abilities many... still work, but, like, yeah. they're... I mean, I think activated abilities are much more often on card text than triggered abilities. Yeah. Triggered abilities, yeah. I don't know. They're sort of... They're both, but just yeah. shutting off so many, and you... And it's just triggered abilities, creatures your opponents control. Yeah. doesn't even have the downside of shutting off your stuff. It's super powerful. She comes out very early. Yeah. Um, Your honorable mentions has a similar card to this. Yeah. Uh, that costs a little bit more, but yeah, anything that can do, uh, anything that can shut down everyone else's cards as in your opponent's control. That that's just like it already makes the tech higher just because it can do that, and the fact that you can play this so early really really makes her. I mean, you can play this on turn two. Yeah. 
Uh, she's super silver, powerful. Yeah. Again, another card that in my honorable mentions, and she's uh, in contention. I thought I had her on the list. I had her off the list. I had yeah. her on the list. The only reason I didn't put her on um, was because I didn't want to have too many creatures. Mm-hmm. So I decided, you know, three was, was about as many as I wanted. Um, and I ranked her behind the other ones just because there are some decks where she doesn't do anything. Against, right. Where she's just right. a three, four flyer. There are definitely decks that don't have activated abilities at all. Or at least aren't super reliant on them. Like yeah, maybe they've deck. got one or two cards. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the like only Lynn reason. Like Lynn Vala comes down, but they're like, well, I still got my Prophet of the Crew fix, so who yeah. cares, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and it's like it doesn't shut off Enter the Battlefield effects and mm-hmm. things like that. So that's the only reason. I mean, don't get me wrong. Really powerful. Really <laughs> yeah. powerful. That Very was my, that was my um, thinking when I didn't have her on the list, though. Uh, right. Okay, we're up to number one. Well, your number two was... You know, oh, yeah. Two. My number two, sorry, was Swords of Plowshares slash Path to Exile. It's there funny that we put them both together. Yeah, they feel very similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, go ahead. I'll let you do your number oh, one. Oh, my number one? Okay, my number one is... You are my number one. Oh, my number one guy. <laughs> <laughs> Stoneforge Mystic. Um, good just card. a good card. Just a really good card. Especially because I think most EDH decks want to find an equipment early. Uh, so she's one in the white for a 1-2 creature, Core Artificer. And when Stoneforge Mystic enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an equipment card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. And for one in the white, you can tap her. You may put an equipment card from your hand onto the battlefield. So not the equipment you necessarily search out. But it can be. But it can be. And with this, you can put out, like, uh, what's that six drop? That gives you plus... Bat- I mean, yeah, you can put out a Skull, which is a five drop for two mana. Uh, you can put out Argentum Armor for two mana. Oh, man. And just start wrecking face. Um, so she essentially helps you cheat out stuff. So she does two things. One, she's a tutor. I mean, half the time I could just see getting Stoneforge. Uh, no, sorry, sorry. Half the time I can see you getting Swiftfoot Boots. Yep. Or Whisper Silk Cloak, Lightning Greaves, yeah. One of and those like staple ones. But you she, can get the huge broken stuff. Yeah, she does two things. She tutors for a card and then she cheats it into play, which are sort of the two, one of the two of the most powerful things you can do in Commander. Yep. Um, so, in Magic, period. In I Magic, mean, Stoneforge yeah. Mystic Rex in every format she's legal. Yeah, yeah. She, you see decks being played with her, but she always just gets a Batter Skull out. And if they don't get rid of the Stoneforge Mystic, then get ready to lose yep um so it's a really powerful card obviously for me it's my number one because i just the, i mean of course if you're running a deck that doesn't have any equipment then sure she's not that great but i think in general you're always going to at least have two or three really good viable targets for her to get and they're always going to be relevant yep i she's super powerful it's it kind of show i don't have her on my list um again she was she was in the running mm-hmm. um and it kind of shows like our different play styles i think because yeah. i actually only just because for me, I don't actually have a lot of equipment in my decks. Uh, you know, I usually have like Swift Foot Boots, Lightning Greaves, and kind of that's it. Yeah. And in some decks, I don't have any of that because I have three decks that don't even play their commander ever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the other like eight or nine decks, like only two of them are really what you'd call Voltron decks. And the rest are like, yeah, the commander's cool, but they're, it's their ability I want. I don't actually need to buff them in yeah. any way, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that's sort of just, that's what it is. Like, because in a lot of decks, Stoneford Mystic is broken like crazy yeah and like on turn two if you have a soul ring out turn one you could also just play the swift foot boots the turn that you fetch it with her yep. you know so i think being two mana and all that um i think it's super relevant but of course like josh said if your deck doesn't rely on equipment and that's totally fine like my animar deck has zero equipment in it, i think right i think, so I think it might just have lightning greaves yeah, yeah. but well, I, of course it can't, even, it can't yeah she yeah. can't play um my number one which was your number three and I'm glad we both picked the same card in this category. And this oh, is yeah. The, I mean, this the, card I, what is... I call the Wrath category. And, yeah. you know, that's another thing that that is right in White's wheelhouse that they're sort of best at is... Uh, Big time Wraths. Is Wraths, yeah. And they were the wraths, original too. Wrath of God, yeah. um, which I, I debated. There was three I was debating between. Mm-hmm. It was Wrath of God, which is two and two white for uh, destroy all creatures that can't be regenerated. There's Acroma's Vengeance, which destroys all artifacts, enchantments, and you and can creatures. cycle it too. Yeah, right? and yeah. it has and it has cycling. Let me read it. Uh, Acroma's Vengeance, just so everybody knows, it's four and two white. Destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. It also has cycling three, which is pay three, discard this card, and draw a card. Yeah, um, it's a sorcery. And then the the um, the one that we both had as the, the one that we both actually picked. Yeah, the big daddy is Terminus. And Terminus is four and two white for a sorcery. It says put all creatures on the bottom of their owner's libraries. But it also has Miracle for one white. And what Miracle is, 
if you you can cast this card for its miracle cost, which is one white mana, mm-hmm. when you draw it, if it's the first card you draw this turn. Yep. So you'll notice if you ever watch coverage of players, uh, pro players almost always take the first card yep. they draw, they put it to the side, like put it face down uh, on the table, and then they flip that up by itself. Yeah, this is because of Miracle, um, because you need to be able to go, oh. Yeah, because once it touches your hand, then no, you can no longer play it for its Miracle cost because it can get lost in your sea of cards and you the cheating. Cheat. Yeah, yeah you cheat. exactly. Yeah. So if you have cards like this in your deck, you need to be careful, although most EDH playgroups are casual enough. Like ours, I don't yeah. think anybody would be like, you're cheating, Josh, because I've lost too many games. If I was cheating, I would <laughs> win a lot more games. Um, <laughs> but the reason that this is powerful more potentially more powerful than those other two, and I think we both agree, yeah. is the bottom of your library is like this place where you don't want your cards in EDH and you specifically don't want your commander down there. Yeah, it's a bottomless, unhappy pit. <laughs> I mean, how many times have you played this? I've done this a bunch of times where I put all, you know, we're in a game of four people and I'm just like, I got Terminus in my hand. I'm just waiting for the last guy to play his commander. Yeah, and then you just Terminus. I, I don't Miracle it. I just for yeah, six for mana. Yeah, six mana doing whatever. that is insane. And in it also has game. the added effect of getting rid of all the other creatures, but yep. I don't even care about that. It's like, oh, all three of your commanders, bottom mm-hmm. of your deck. Uh, tokens are just, they disappear. Tokens are just <clears> gone. <throat> yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah. The Miracle is just that icing on top where like, because this is like great, right? Late game, let's say you're losing. You Miracle this card, oh, you, yeah. you are back in the running. Yep. Yeah. Plus you can Miracle it and play something huge. Yeah, exactly. Because one white is crazy for that effect. Yeah. So Terminus, um, clearly an all-star in Commander. Um, the reason I had it number one, too, is because the the I find myself often in a switch in situations where I'm building a deck, and I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, man, I wish I could play white in this deck because I need wraths. Yeah. And white has the most wraths. And the best and the ones. And the best ones. And this, I think, is the best of those. <clears throat> so I felt like... It's I, not even like a real wrath, either. <clears throat> it's it's a tuck. You know, but it, yeah, part. but it does it destroys them. I mean, they're not yeah. in play and they don't have them in their hand. You know, and it's, it's very hard for them to get it back. Yeah, yeah. So it's all it's as if you were playing against a normal deck that just had more copies of those cards, so they mm-hmm. could potentially still get them later, draw yeah. them later. But I mean, this card's still good when you're winning too, because you can yeah. just be like, okay, great, I got more gas in my hand, and like, I'm a, they just put something else out that might take us towards parity. Like, let me just miracle this guy and r- start over on my board, and I'm fine. Rafts with that. are great because you can craft the situation you know yes. you have the wrath yeah you know oh i would normally play this if but i have a wrath so i won't and mm-hmm. i'll just wait for everybody to play one extra creature then i'll just get them yep i'll get them i'll get them you're my number one <laughs> get them all <laughs> so all right. okay let's go through some of our honorable mentions yes um i'll go first okay uh i had luminarch ascension oh yes so this is a uh, this is a cycle of ascension cards yep. and the way that these all work is that uh you can put quest counters on them and there are different ways to do it and uh once a certain number of quest counters are fulfilled then the card has an extra ability usually for some mana that does something pretty broken yeah and i think of the ascensions this is the best one there's, yeah there's a couple other that are playable but this one's crazy i think powerful. this is the best for edh it's, how cheap it is is insane yeah so okay it's one and a white for an enchantment it says at the beginning of each opponent's end step if you didn't lose life this term you know you may put a quest counter on luminarch ascension so it um if you play this on turn two there's a good chance that in a multiplayer game that you have all the quest counters you need by the time the mm-hmm. turn comes back around to you because it's each opponent yeah so if I play it and then Jimmy doesn't attack me or do damage to me, then I get a quest counter. And then Craig doesn't do damage or attack me, I get a quest counter. Qu- yeah. And then Alex doesn't do damage. And then it's like, so... In one turn, you get three quest counters, Correct. You can get more if there's yeah, more players, more, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, so it's very easy. <coughs> it's easier than in a normal game. You know, this was made for one-on-one where <coughs> is somebody really going to go four turns? They're going to be able to do damage to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the kicker is for... It has a activated ability on it. It's for one in a white colon so you can do this as many times as you've got mana oh my gosh put a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying onto the battlefield you can only activate this ability if you have four more quest counters on it insanity oh, a 4-4 white flyer for, for two, two mana, mana instant speed many times as you want ta- yeah it's crazy i mean this is one of those cards where the downside of the card is like I said earlier, I was saying like blind obedience doesn't actually cause it does a lot. It cause it does, that much hate, yeah. yeah. This, this card, card causes a ton of hate. Yeah. Everyone's like, hit that guy, hit him a lot. You have to, because you will just overwhelm the table. Yeah. I mean, they can't even board wipe. You're just like, okay, fine. Make seven more angels after you did that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's cr- it's very, very powerful. So and yeah. also white is 
one of the main token generating colors, maybe the main token generating color. And I felt really bad having my whole list and I didn't have a token generator on there. Oh, yeah. So I had it at number 10 for a long time, but Blind Obedience is a pet card of mine. Yep, there you go. So. And I had a lot more token generation, so we filled it out nicely. Yeah. Um, one of my honorable mentions is a card that came out very recently. It's Hushwing Griff. And Josh hates this card, obviously. <laughs> but it is very powerful. It's um, it does it does what Torpor Orb does, but it's on a creature that has flash. It's two and a white for a two one flyer with flash. And creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. Shuts off all their shuts off the all battlefield. that stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's the flash is really underrated part of it because you basically oh, yeah. counter the first one. They think they're going to get an effect because they're, I'm going to play this creature. I'm going to get to enter the battlefield, and you flash in Hushwing Grip. Yep. And then it's like, oh, you don't get that. Yeah. So very, very powerful. Um, just a very good utility card. I think it's it's in the quote unquote sideboard arena for you know if you have a lot of decks that have a lot of enter the battlefield effects. But I think in general, EDH players do use ETB effects a lot. A lot, a lot. I would say yeah, it, it can belong in the main deck of any yeah. sort of. You know, it's very good. It's like in a hate bear type of effect. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, my next honorable mention is Austere Command. Oh, I love this card. Austere Command is four and two white for a sorcery. Uh, it's like it's in the cycle with Cryptic Command and the rest yeah. of them. It says choose two. Oh, that's so already your, good. <laughs> yeah. Your options are destroy all artifacts, destroy all enchantments, destroy all creatures with converted mana cost three or less, or destroy all creatures with converted mana cost four or more. So you get to choose two of those. Mm-hmm. So essentially, you could do the board wipe. You could three or less or four or more. That gets rid of every creature. Right. Or if you look around, you're like, well... There's only creatures really four or more that I care that about. That I care about. And there's some artifacts I don't like, so I'll do those two. Yeah. Or there's some enchantments I don't like. And the creatures are all small. I'll do those two. Yeah. The versatility on the card is very powerful. Yeah. Also, white, again, within white's color pie is the ability to destroy artifacts and enchantments. Mm-hmm. So I felt like we needed to have a representation of a card that did that. The other one is Return to Dust. Right. And that that's a... It's not as... Uh... It's flexible yes. as a steer command. But it's a little bit more efficient. <clears throat> yeah. Well, not necessarily. What Return to Dust is an instance, two and two white, It you exile target artifact or enchantment. But if you play it during your turn, your main phase, you can exile an additional artifact or enchantment. So basically right. it's rid of two things. Um, you know, sometimes... It's four uh, mana as well, so it's a little cheaper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not three white. And you can do it at instant speed, so if you have to play it on someone else's turn, obviously you it's can. not ideal, but you can. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I prefer Austere Command to this card, but you know both of them were in the running. Yeah. Again, I just felt obligated to put, this is just something white does. This is destroy artifacts and enchantments, and, mm-hmm. and it's sort of the best at that. Uh, green's also very good at it. Maybe it's yeah. not the best, but anyway. Um, one of my cards I put on here that it isn't a cheap one because it's old and it's busted. Uh, it's called <laughs> Replenish. Uh, yeah. It's three and a white for a sorcery. Return all enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Um, I think that enchantments Ooh. are the one thing that need to get removed in in EDH. Otherwise, they will take over the game very quickly because there are so many enchantments that are just so crazy powerful that that oftentimes you'll find that stuff gets off the battlefield more often than it stays there. Like if someone puts down like doubling season, you got to get rid of it. Right. So replenish is just <clears throat> is just a great way to bring everything back at once. And even if it's just bringing one enchantment card, it's onto the battlefield. Um it's not bad. Not bad. Oh, it's very very powerful. <laughs> uh the fact that it puts them onto the battlefield is is really what puts this into the crazy. Yeah. Because you can be discarding stuff, you can be like putting it there knowing you have this in your hands. Right. If you yeah, if you you can just yeah, if you're drawing a ton of cards, be like, well, I'm just going to ditch all these guys and play Replenish. Yep, exactly. So it cheats stuff into play. That's, yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, next up for me is Restoration Angel. Uh, three and a white for mm-hmm. a 3-4 angel with flash and flying. When Resto Angel enters the battlefield, you may exile target non-angel creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under your control. So it, it flickers a card. At flash. At flash speed. Um, it's a ton of utility. It's also just a very powerful card. It's a 3-4 uh, flash And something flyer. to note about this card is that it returns that card to the battlefield under your control then. Yeah. It doesn't wait until the end step, which a lot of flicker cards do, mm-hmm. which can be really powerful because if you have something like Acidic Slime, yeah. you kill something now. They don't get to like use it, attack mm-hmm. with it, anything. You just go boom. And that is, I think, what puts Resto Angel into like a different, slightly different category than your average flicker. Yeah. You can also... I mean, the nice thing is like you'd also would tap your guys and attack with them or something, and then they're like, cool, I got a free swing at you, and then yeah. Resto Angel comes in and it bounces, it comes back... Standing, untapped, untapped yeah. yeah, and you can get some advantageous blocks out of that. Obviously, you want to trigger enter the battlefield effects with this. Um, it's just very useful. I really like it. Uh, it, it, it. 
it has a place, I think, in most decks if you can find a place for it. And if you have a lot of creatures that can abuse the end of the battlefield stuff. And it's tricky. I like being tricky. I like being tricky. I um, like it. My next one is Rest in Peace. Uh, good Rest card. in Peace is one in a white for an enchantment. It says when Rest of Peace enters the battlefield, exile all cards from all graveyards. Sorry, BDM. For two mana. Yeah, sorry, Sadisi decks. Um, if a card or token would be put into a graveyard <clears throat> from anywhere, exile it instead. Right. So it clears all the graveyards and then basically says there's no such thing as a graveyard anymore. Yeah, and that's the cool thing is because it's it's from anywhere. So someone mills a card mills, off the top of their deck, yeah, discards, discards from their hand. Dis- yeah, destroyed. And yeah. there are a lot of cards that are like when a token or non-token creature dies or is put into the graveyard from play, like it just really hoses so many important cards. Like Academy Rector is one that uh, we didn't yep. talk about, but yep. that card is also super powerful. Yeah, so... This is one of the <clears throat> best uh, graveyard hate cards in, out there. So yeah, and it's two mana. It's two mana, and it's an enchantment. You can get it back with replenish. Oh gosh, <laughs> you can get a lot of things back with replenish. That card is busted. Um, Academy Rector is my next card. It's a uh, three and a white for a one two. When Academy Rector is put into a graveyard from play, you may remove uh, Academy Rector from the game, essentially exiling it. If you do, search your library for an enchantment card and put that card into play. The into play part is what puts this into the yeah. obnoxiously powerful. Yeah. It, you can put so much stuff into play with this card. The worst is when somebody gets an Academy Rector out with you and then Voltron's it. And you're like, <laughs> I don't want to kill it. I don't want to kill it, but I have to. But it's otherwise. hitting me for seven. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Not to mention just sack outlets. Um, mm-hmm. You can do stuff like uh, there's a couple of like pattern of rebirth, so you get double triggers yep, off of it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, okay. My last one is. Uh, Iona, Shield ah. of Ameria. And uh, in the same game where the dude played um, Elish Norn on me. He played this. He played uh, Iona. And you're playing a mono green deck, I too. I was <laughs> playing my mono green Titania deck. I'll, I'm just going to let everybody out there guess how that turned out. Um, it's it's a mean card. It, it, pa- from a pure power perspective, maybe it belongs in the top 10. I don't know. Maybe. Um, it's, it's expensive, though. It is a little bit narrow sometimes. But man, is it powerful. I mean, he just happened to run into my only monocolored deck. Yeah. You know? Otherwise, I wouldn't even care. Um, okay, sorry. Iona, Shield of Emeria. She's six and three white, so nine total for a legendary creature angel. She's a 7-7 seven, seven flyer. As Iona, Shield of Emeria, enters the battlefield, choose a color. Your opponents can't cast spells of the chosen color. So, Oof. right there, mono decks are just done. Yeah. Like, it's a win car. It just almost always will just win against a monocolor deck. Mm-hmm. I mean, almost always. I mean, duplicate is like, you better hope they have a duplicate. Or like a can't. Memnarch deck is yeah. technically a mono blue deck, but yeah. Um, but yeah, it just shuts off. And also you can all, a lot of times look around and be like, oh, well, you all have blue. Also just name blue. Yeah, and you shut off a third of everyone's deck. Or yeah. Or half of it. Um, it's just, the the effect is very powerful. I'm not... I actually don't have this in a single deck. I just know that it's super powerful. <laughs> yeah. And maybe I was slanted because it just got played on me last night and literally destroyed me. But, you know, I don't think it's a particularly fun card. I don't I wouldn't mm. I wouldn't necessarily play it because it's just not the type of card. It reminds me of Blood Moon a little bit. Yeah. Um Oh, it definitely doesn't really Where yeah. not only does it hurt them, but it also <clears throat> hurts their ability to deal with it. Yeah. That's what I don't like. Like I like you'd think I wouldn't like Armageddon because I don't like Blood Moon, but that's different. Armageddon, I can still play a land. Armageddon happens and then it's done. It's not sitting there continuing to affect the board. Right. Whereas Blood Moon does something that then hurts my ability to destroy Blood Moon. Yeah. And that's what Iona can do. Mm-hmm. Good call. I like Iona though. She's a little too expensive. And I, I don't think like it, her at all. If there have to, if, if I have to put someone that's above eight CMC, it would be Avacyn in the top ten and not yeah. Iona. Nine's a lot. Yeah. Um uh, the next card I'm going to talk about is kind of, it's still being tested. I don't think we know the full extent of it yet, but it's from Fate Reforged and it's Monastery oh, I Mentor. I like having a new one on here. Yeah, it's two and a white for a 2-2 two, two human monk with prowess. So whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Not that significant, but what is significant, it well, says, significant. whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put a 1-1 one, one white monk creature token with prowess onto the battlefield. With prowess. The token has prowess. Yeah. That's, that's insane. insane. That is insane. Um... Yeah, this could be crazy. I don't know. I wish it was legendary so you could build around it. <laughs> I don't. It shouldn't be legendary. Oh, my gosh. The deck that makes this card is just... Yeah, it could, I think it's... I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But yeah. I think you could you, it, you could make it legendary and it would be on... Po- I mean, look at Risk the Redeemed or something. Yeah. Like, he just doubles the amount of tokens you have. So, like, I don't know. Is this objectively more powerful than that? I don't think so. I think it's similar. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, 
It's a very powerful card, though. Yeah. Um, it is insane. That's why all the Jeskai pre-releases, uh, pre-release packs were yeah, gone. That are wanted. because everyone wanted the Foil Monastery Mentor. Yeah, um, it's it's a very powerful card. It'll, it remains to be seen. I think at this point, how powerful because yeah. do token decks play enough no, non-creature spells to yeah. make that? A thing. a thing. I mean, they yeah. do because there's a lot of spells that make tokens that are non-creature spells. Is this but better in the multi-colored deck? They usually cost deck? so much mana yeah. that it's like, well, I don't know. Does getting one extra one one every turn? I don't know. I don't know yet. Yeah, it's, it feels build around me, but at the same time, the the power level is just it's it feels very pushed. Yeah, you know, it feels like it, it is a powerful, powerful card. The closest analog we have is like Young Pyromancer, mm -hmm. which, which is, is better and worse in a lot of in some ways. Like it, the yeah. the tokens don't have prowess, but he costs one less. Um, but that's not a huge EDH table. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. This is an interesting we, pick. We will see. Yeah. All right. So I don't, we have more honorable mentions. I think we're going to move on because otherwise we're just going to talk about every white card that's ever <laughs> been. Yeah. And we'll keep. We'll put all of these on the uh, on the podcast itself in the the text box below. So you guys. And can we'd check love out the to hear notes. your list uh, in the comment section on Rocket Jump. Go ahead and make yes. out your list of your top ten white cards. And there's been um, a lot of great contributions to the other ones that uh, always bring up cards, and I'm like, oh right. Well, it's been awesome for for me. I don't know about for you, but you know, on the red one oh, and the yeah. artifacts one, like I just looked through everybody else's list, and I, you know, there's a few cards in there where you're like, I didn't even think about that card. Mm -hmm. That card is awesome. Yep. So you know, it's good for us to sort of, you know, as we're hopefully illuminating new cards out to you, you can do the same to us, and everybody yeah. can have awesome cards that they can smash their friends with. Yeah. Because that's definitely. what it's about. All right. Well, it's that time of the podcast where we get to announce some winners. Winner was winner. Was winner. Uh, I'm applauding for really, the winners. Really quickly, um, the winners from last week, didn't you email didn't us. email us. So we can't send out the prizes because we don't know who you are or where <laughs> you live. Um, I, you I, did, I put it in the mail and I didn't put an address on it. And, and you put like some username from the yeah, iTunes. And it just got returned to me. So, so that was a bummer. Please email us. And we're going to announce two winners this week. And you also need to email us. The email address is commandcast at rocketjump.com. Yep. So... And you can find that in the show notes. You can find that on the uh, webpage on Rocket Jump. Um, so again, you need to email us your name and your address if you want to receive your prizes. And you, I'm sure you do. Yeah, there's some good prizes. We're mm -hmm. talking Commander 2014. Well, actually, that's what you guys are winning this week. Yeah. So very exciting. So want to announce them? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> number one winner. Number, number, number one winner is Lucid Voltil. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing that last part right, right? Yeah, Voltil. So. Yeah. So congrats, Lucid. Uh, you just send us an email, and you get some free stuff. And winner number two is Vince Vindicated. Very vindicated. Don't play Vindicate on me, though. Please. Don't play Vindicate on my um, Iona. <laughs> <laughs> or my Elish Norn. Just don't play Vindicate. Okay. All right. No, yes, play it. Yeah, play it's it. It's awesome. TIE Fighters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so congrats to Lucid Voltiel and Vince Vindicated. You guys are the winners for this week. Just send us an email with your name and your mailing address, and we will get your prize packs out to you ASAP. ASAP. As soon as possible. That's what it stands for. All right, time for the end step, Jimmy. <laughs> All right, cleanup phase. Um, do you have a cool thing you want to talk about? I do. I'll go first. Okay, you go you first. Think. Yeah, I'll, I'll brainstorm. Um, read it up. Well, I just will talk about a cool book I've been reading recently. There's oh, okay. an author named Brandon Sanderson who is a magic player. Yeah? Yeah, he's actually the guy, if anybody read Wheel of Time, which was by Robert Jordan, it was a very big epic fantasy series, kind of Game of thrones -y, before Game of Thrones was around. And uh, Robert Jordan unfortunately died um, before the series was done. And huh. Brandon Sanderson was the author that they tapped to finish the series, and that's how I became aware of him. And he has a series. It's called the Reckoners series. The first book is called Steelheart, which I really enjoyed. And his second Sounds book... Sounds like a magic card. Yeah. It's kind of this... The thing that Brandon Sanderson is known for, and I can't help but think it's be, it's influenced by his magic playing, mm -hmm. uh, um, is that his magic systems within his books are very well thought out. They have oh. a lot, They're very well... like. You know, you know the rules and how things work, right. and he works within the strategy of, of cool. those rules of his magic system. So that's that's sort of like his his uh, stylistic. Uh, I don't know. It's it's one of his. It's a well word, built Jimmy? universe. Yeah, it's just something he's known for. So the the new book is called Firefight, and I've been enjoying. But the first book in the series is called Steelheart. So I would definitely they both sound like magic card names. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's this universe where there's. It's sort of there's superheroes uh -huh. kind of, but they're not heroes. They're all villains. Like all these people oh, have cool. been given superpowers, but the superpowers themselves sort of like warp the people. And so yeah. it's 
Yeah, so that reminds me of BBC Four had a show that was like that, where they they just gave superpower to these these kids, and uh-huh. like they're just gonna be reckless with them, obviously. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but the people are that get the powers that absolutely like they're they're like absolutely like evil, evil. So ah, cool. All um, right, nice. Yeah, so that's that's my one cool thing. How about you? Uh, my one cool thing, I, I actually looked over and I saw it on my bookshelf. It's a, a new board game that I picked up over the holidays that uh, my brother introduced me to. It's called For Sale. It's it's for a, sale? For sale, yeah. Okay. It's really, really simple. Um, it's I, it, I think it's one of the best board games to play. They just teach people within like five minutes and everyone gets it. That's really you can important. Play a game, you can play a game within 10 minutes, so no one feels like they're like, oh, here we go, two hours of the Game of Thrones board game or whatever. <laughs> um, it's really simple. There are two phases. You start off with a set amount of money, and then you lay out these property cards that go from a value of one to thirty. Thirty is a space station, and one is a doghouse. So you oh, get. Oh man, the I idea. want a space station. Yeah, exactly. And so you lay them out uh, according to the number of players on the table, and everyone bids uh, in order. And uh, you can only increase your bid to try and win, uh, pay the the least amount. You want to pay the least amount because you have like six rounds to get the best property. And the first person that says, "I can't do it. I can't bid anymore," drops out. They take half of their bid back and they take whatever is the lowest card on the table. So uh, that goes around and usually after one person drops out, someone else is like, well, they took the one, but there's a 12 there. That's pretty good. That's the next number. So I'll just take that and pay this small amount for it. And you do that six times until you have a nice hand of you know five or six property cards. And then you go to the second phase where you pull out money cards and you try and sell your properties. And the way you do that is you lay out the money cards from uh, 15000 to zero dollars. And you put a card out, and everyone flips their properties at the same time, and you just line them up. So if you put a 30 out, and everyone else is under you, then you get the $15,000, the highest money, essentially. And everyone goes down sequentially from that. Hmm. So it's all it's all about bluffing. It's a lot about sort of figuring out, like, hmm, I bet everyone's going to waste their high cards here, so I'm just going to pop out my lowest card and get a pretty good value for, uh-huh. you know, like a doghouse. I got 3000 bucks. Like, that's amazing, or whatever. And by the end, you just tally up how much money you have, and that's the game. Pretty cool. Sounds fun. Pretty simple. Yeah, I want to play. Yeah, we can. Uh, it is very fast to do, and the it, it's a lot deeper than you would imagine for uh-huh. being such a simple game. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, those are our cool things. Those are our cool things. Prize winners from last week. Make sure you email us. We want to give week. you stuff. And this week, of course. Yeah. Um, and until next time, I look forward to reading your top ten list. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. All right. We'll see you next time. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>